So I've been working on a uh, troubleshooting guide that hopefully is going to be published in the next uh, few weeks on the Verkada website. And the idea behind this is to get you some pointers on how to tackle issues in case you are deploying our devices and for a reason they do not become green in command. There are lots of things that can go wrong during the install to uh, impact this. But um, before I go ahead, I wanted to also emphasize the fact that we do have 24 seven support. So if you're ever in trouble and you want to have an engineer have a look at and advise you, all you need to do is go in within command. There's a question mark on the bottom left hand side. And then from there, you will see the phone numbers you can call us or even initiate a live chat. But before you do that, what are the things that usually go wrong and how are you able to understand what's happening? The clear way to troubleshoot a Verkada device and understand its state is look at its LED status. So every device comes with at least a LED that hopefully if everything is all right will be solid blue. And that means that the device itself is connected to the cloud and functions properly. Small caveat to this, because of design considerations and making sure that the device blends in and within its environment, the sensor team has decided to make the LED white. So the device again does not stand out, especially if you're deploying it into, for example, a dormitory or a changing room. If you plug a new Verkada device in, what you'd expect is that it goes through solid orange, means it's booting up. It might flash orange in case there is a discrepancy between the firmware on the device and the firmware it should be on. So all the devices will update their firmware as they boot. And then hopefully it goes into that solid blue state. If it's flashing blue, it actually means that although the device itself is operational, that something is wrong in within the network that stops the device reaching the Verkada cloud. We're slowly introducing also LED patterns and you'll see them across all the cameras and the AC12 controller. And that means that if there's any sort of network issues, you'll actually see, for example, on the cameras, the LED flashing multiple times blue, then once orange, then another sequence of blue, then orange. So all you need to do is count the number of flashes and then refer back to our documentation to clearly identify the issue. That could be anything from the device not getting an IP, duplicate IPs, firewall issues, SSL decrypt being turned on, duplicate IP addresses being detected, etc. So now it's very, very easy if you're a camera customer to identify what the problem is. And this firmware is now live and should aid you in troubleshooting any camera that we have in our portfolio. On the AC12, you actually have a separate LED, which is called a network LED. So in case the status LED is uh, flashing blue, then all you need to do is have the same workflow and count the number of flashes that the network LED is showing you. The bigger controllers, the environmental sensors and all the alarm devices only have the basic uh, flashing blue behavior. However, the intercom itself has a bay of LEDs, which is usually hidden that will light up during the boot. And then if that bay of LEDs is stuck, all you need to do is count the number of LEDs and again, refer back to our documentation to understand exactly what is the problem in within your network. But what if you plug the device in and there is no light? Well, there are a few things that can go wrong. First of all, all the devices will need connectivity into a switch. So if that switch port is down, well, there's not gonna be any sort of power flowing through it. So all the devices that require PoE to boot up will simply not work. So do make sure that the switch port you're connecting to is turned on. There is no sort of authentication on it. A lot of the enterprises do mandate authentication on the switch port. And actually I have a video that talks more about the network components and why there's security on that port to start with. And also to make sure that it provides PoE. And that brings me to another important consideration. Any small Verkada device, any small form factor, think about cameras, environmental sensors, alarm hubs, intercoms, do require PoE to work. However, they take that PoE is irrelevant. It can be a PoE injector if your switch cannot supply PoE, but usually it's done from the switch itself because again, it's much, much easier. Each switch 
has a PLE budget, so don't assume that if you have a 24 port switch and you have a few free ports, that that switch still has enough power to cater for the new devices. So make sure, again, that the PLE budget is not exceeded. And then there's the question of what level of PLE you're providing that particular device. Indoor cameras need regular PLE, while outdoor cameras, because they have heating elements in within them to make sure that when it's cold, the lens does not get foggy, will require PLE+. Plus. And that's the same for the intercom, because the intercom in itself is based on an outdoor camera. And there are two other cameras that actually require the PLE++ standard, and that is the multi-sensor and the PTZ. If you're not supplying the right PLE to the device, it might still boot up, but for example, it might be stuck in orange because it does not have all the necessary power capabilities to boot properly. Remember that Verkada does supply PLE injectors, and even if you forgot to order some, well, PO injector is a PO injector, so if you have one laying around that has the same standard, well, go ahead and use that. In the case of the AC12 controller, it is a small device, so it will require you to power it uh, with PoE. Well, there are certain capabilities that are actually shut down in case you do not provide the right level of PoE. And very importantly, that if you want to have a camera downstream, so you want to use the output port on the AC12 to backhaul a camera or any sort of PoE device that if you do not supply the AC12 with PoE++, it will not be able to pass PoE++ down that particular port. And the same with the outdoor gateway. The GC31E is able to be powered via PoE++. There is a certain injector, the 90 watt one, which is actually much more powerful than the usual 60 watts that you would scope for a multi-sensor or a PTZ. And the reason being is that it does have two downstream ports that it can supply up to 60 watts. So make sure that gateway has enough power because if not, again, you see very weird uh, behaviors such as, for example, the device uh, keep rebooting itself. Another issue that sometimes might uh, crop up, hopefully not that often, is the fact that Ethernet in itself is limited to 100 meters and just by putting a PoE injector in the middle does not allow you to double this to 200. Remember the injectors themselves just put on power on the spare copper ports and have nothing to do with regenerating that particular signal. So there are lots of network requirements that hopefully you have them in within your estate so there shouldn't be a problem namely uh, DHCP to give uh, the device an IP address all our devices do need DHCP initially to boot and connect to the cloud a working DNS server because the devices themselves come hard-coded with Verkada URLs that they will have to reach out to register to the cloud and the device itself should be able to contact the internet over TCP 4100 so that is for the HTTPS, the protocol that we use to securely transfer data to and from the cloud, and UDP 123, which allows the device to understand what time it is. If UDP 123 is blocked, you go and get into issues, for example, like the device not being able to boot up properly because it's trying to upgrade this firmware, but it does not know what time it is. So you'll be stuck in this upgrade loop. Or if it booted up, you'll actually see weird times in command. So if you see some footage and it's indexed as it happened in 1970, well, I can assure you that everything is fine. It's just the NTP itself is blocked. Once you unblock it, in a few minutes, you will refresh command and actually see the proper time indexing has taken place. A few important issues also can occur when you physically install the cameras, especially the outdoor ones. Remember that the outdoor ones need to be sealed from water so you need to make sure that when you run the cables through it that the seal is tight enough not to uh, allow water to leak in and if the camera comes with desiccant packs so for example that will be like a dome or fisheye or a ninny that you take that desiccant pack out of the box and apply it on the correct side you'll actually see it marked on the camera itself apply desiccant pack here if you don't do that well, in about a day or two, when you come back, you'll actually see that there is fog that started to appear in within the lens. And that means that you'll have to go back to site and hopefully soon enough before the device gets broken. There is no RMA at the moment 
for devices that are broken due to a poor install and water issues another thing that sometimes happens especially if you're like pointing domes for example or minis is that each of them has ir illuminators on the side and it's very very easy to miss and point them in the right direction basically collapsing the ir illuminators in the case and that will mean that again once the night comes what you'll actually see in command will be the actual ir illuminators reflecting back into the lens and impeding you to see anything else. And do make sure that when you handle uh, these cases that you wipe off any sort of smudges because all this dirt that, by the way, does accumulate throughout the life cycle of the camera, so you'll still need to clean it from time to time, will actually again impact the quality, especially at night when those IR illuminators will bounce back. With access control, a lot of the issues that I personally see is with regards to faulty wiring so this is when the wire itself is not in good condition or it's not actually tied in properly and that sometimes for example makes the doors not close or even the reader not work properly i'm actually excited that Vercada is launching in the next few weeks so that's end of may a feature that will allow you to see in command that the reader itself has issues communicating with the controller itself so at least you'll be able to know that ahead of time and go and rectify it also do make sure that if you're using our access control and cameras to do license plate recognition unlock that the camera itself is able to reach the controller through the local area network because remember the camera will read the number plate and then it will pass it through the LAN to the access controller it's purely a local communication because what we're trying to do is we're trying to bypass the cloud and make sure that this process still works even if the internet is down. With the sensor itself, uh, well, there are clear guidelines on where you should place it, depending if you're trying to track vape, so that's usually on the ceiling, CO2, that's usually on the wall, or for everything else, well, put it as close as possible to what you're trying to track. Well, do make sure that there is no strong airflow in the region where you're placing the sensor. So for example, if you're placing it next to the HVAC unit or the aircon, well, as you can imagine, that will skew the results quite significantly. Last but not least, talking about alarms, what usually happens with alarms is that if you're using our wireless sensors and the wireless hub, you also have to account for the distance between them. We say that it's about a thousand feet for line of sight, but obviously when we're deploying these, we are deploying it in buildings and there's lots of obstructions that can impact negatively the signal you'll see the signal strength in within command, but my recommendation will be to provision the sensors next to the hub itself and then go and place them in the right place. So at least you know that the sensor itself is fine when it booted initially. Worst case scenario, if you're putting them in a part of the building that does not have good signal, where you can complement that by either deploying a console or a keypad that have a hub built in or deploy another hub separately. And that brings me to the final piece of advice that I'll give you. Make sure you provision these devices ahead of time because you don't want to be in a situation where, let's say, you know, you spend all day screwing the cameras on the wall, etc. You turn them on and now they do not work. What's wrong? You don't know right it can be the network it can be the device provisioning the device ahead of time on a desk with a switch at least will take the device out of consideration so you know that it does not need to be rna 